Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hello, hello, Langley. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast again. It's great to be back, Mimi. Thank you for having me. Well, now that you're here a second time, you are going to be considered a regular. So you're going to have to get used to me bothering you frequently now to talk to me. (laughs) I look forward to number three already. (laughs) Well, (laughs) off air, we were kind of teasing and talking where I said, oh my gosh, I looked at my notes and I had all these things I still need to talk to Langley about. So yeah, I basically am already slating for future episodes, but congratulations on all of the amazing, wonderful things, all the projects you're working on. Um, of course, the most recent world premiere of Collision on Netflix. Uh, it was, it's always great to see you on screen, but there was something really special about seeing you in South Africa, in your element. And I know you've done other things before, but of course, I'm used to seeing you as the evil Buckley and warrior. And so it was really, it was kind of cool to kind of just, oh, that's the, here comes the dialects that we talked about last time. And you're like kind of your native speech. So, um, but congrats on all of this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Collision has kind of taken us all a bit by surprise in terms of how well it's been received and how, how, how well it's done on Netflix around the world. Um, it's, it's my, my director keeps, uh, sending me little snippets of, you know, all the statistics, all the numbers, because he's, he's obviously so excited that his film has done so well. Uh, he sent me a clip to say that it's, it was the number six most watched film in Netflix around the world last week. And that is taking into consideration the fact that it was only available for four days of the week last week. So yeah. he's, he's over the moon. We're all very excited. I mean, you know, this, it's a low budget movie that was shot for, um, and well under a million dollars and uh wow. okay yeah in in three weeks uh in the middle of lockdown in johannesburg which is a city that has rolling blackouts power outages uh every day and, and did have every day uh during the shoot last year so we had logistical challenges that filmmakers in you know first world countries don't ever uh, or often have to think about and, uh, you know, obviously in lockdown in South Africa, I don't know if you know this, but we had a curfew, mm. uh, at, and, at which at some stages was 11 o'clock at night, some stages 12 o'clock. And if I remember correctly, it was, it was, it was 11 o'clock at night when we were shooting. And when you consider that, the, you know, so many of the scenes in the film are night shoots and were shot downtown in Johannesburg, which Whole, the whole power grid would often go out in the middle of the shoot and oh. traffic lights, which obviously play quite a big part in the film, would go out. Yeah. And so we, there were some logistical challenges that that fortunately didn't seem to affect the way that the film was received, mm-hmm. uh, which is great. And and we're all really, you know, impressed and, and su- pleasantly surprised, but, but so proud of the fact that it's done so well. Um, and 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 on a budget of so little in such a short time frame with an all South African cast and crew, you know, which is also a, bi- a big thing. Fabian, yeah. our director, Fabian is, is he's a Frenchman who lives in L.A. So apart from him, it was an entirely <laughs> South African affair. <laughs> yes, I, that's that just must be so special for you. And now hearing all of the challenges for production and, you know, during filming, that kind of really puts it in perspective and. I, you know, of course I'm, I was tickled because I get to watch you as always. That's always a lot of fun. And I'm like, are you ever going to be like the super nice guy? (laughs) Yeah. You just just get to see a different kind of racist every time. (laughs) (laughs) And that's really funny because you're like the direct opposite of all of your characters. Like you couldn't be further from, which I guess is kind of a quote unquote fun. I don't know. Fun's the right word to play, but like, you know, that challenge as an actor, but yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, gosh, it's, you're such a great actor because I usually don't like you on screen. And as, and when you're on this screen with me on the podcast, I adore you. And so it's, it's a lot of fun, but I know it's a fictional movie. And, um, but one of the things that 
I really appreciate because I'm not sure, you know, I, 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 I do the, I feel like I look through Netflix at what to watch more often than I actually watch anything on Netflix. I feel like I'm watching yeah. trailers more than anything. And, you know, I'm like, okay, because you're in this, I absolutely made it a, a highlight for me. And I was so grateful because I really enjoy the opportunity, one, to see like a South African cast, which I normally would not see. Like I don't actually go to the international channel and kind of, you know, delve in, um, you know, to, to my embarrassment. But what kind of jumped out at me was a lot of the themes in the film made me think. Right. Because, of course, there's parallelism, parallelism around the world of a lot of, of racism and all the things happening. But really, as Americans, it's so embarrassing that we just pretty much absorb ourselves in everything that's happening here and how hard it is here and how bad our lives are and, and all the controversy. But clearly there's a lot going on. And again, I know this was a movie, yeah. but I can't help but think, wow, there are definitely a lot of things going on in um, South Africa. And, and I'd, I'd mm -hmm. love your your I'd love your knowledge on it and your your opinion, especially on the 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 controversy between like refugees coming in from other parts of South Africa and just seeing like the, you know, the continent itself, like all the different countries and mm -hmm. that dynamic, like I, I'd love for yeah. you to share what what kind of you got from the film and, and how that all those themes played. Absolutely. So I'd love to talk about collision and I shall I mean, I just want to say up front, you know, with regards to what you just uh, mentioned, it has always taken me and I think a lot of people by surprise uh, when when we find out that the like the high school uh, history curriculum in the U.S. has very little history, uh, you know, to do with the outside world, it's very. I've, I've always found it, and I, I know a lot of other people have found the found it quite insular. Um, and I don't know why that is, because I mean, it is, you know, I really do believe that you know, it's it's kind of like we are part of a, a global village. And, and we are one big human family. And we, it's kind of, I, I feel it's kind of useful and helpful, you know, to know how things are going on, you know, what's going on with your neighbor, how are things over there? Good, okay, good, you know, and, and, yeah. and we, um, you know, around the world, I, I think for the most part, most countries around the world, in South Africa, certainly, you know, my high school and university history curriculum was, was very much an international curriculum. I mean, I, in my senior year at high school, um, my my final high school project, history project, was on the American Civil War, and you know it, there is obviously a great interest in global history, uh, in 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 places around the world. But I know that a lot of really well educated American friends of mine do have a limited knowledge of about the history and the kind of socio economic, socio political climates of countries around the world. And I hope that is something that I get to see changing and evolving uh, within the United States going forward. Like I really, I think, I think it'll just it'll be better for the world uh, and everyone in general. It's uh, I love the U.S. and I love America and I I love you I love you guys. It's just <laughs> that has always been something that I've found really strange about. Uh, about the U.S. education system. So now that I've given you a bit of a lecture, no, <laughs> lecture. no, and and a rightful a rightful one. And I will say uh, we have enough trouble having the American history be accurate, let alone getting into the global history. I can't imagine how botched they're going to make that um, narrative. So it's it's a struggle. Um, education is yeah. a struggle, and it is an embarrassment, honestly. And you're one thousand percent right on it. So oh. thank you for calling us out. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a bit speechless now, uh, oh. <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about collision. So, okay. so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it really is. The story is, you know, we obviously, the film was made with the, with the intention to entertain first and foremost, but obviously, you know, the, another intention of the film was to educate people in other countries who aren't, who don't know uh, kind of the socio-political climate in South Africa what it's about, what we're dealing with at the moment. So if we start with my character, Johan Kreser in the film, he basically is, you know, he's an everyman. He's a very typical um, white heterosexual 
kind of middle class, upper middle class guy of about my age, my generation. This character was based on people I knew and know. Uh, he's, he's not that far removed from me as an individual in many aspects, certainly with the, with the parenting aspect, with the teenage daughter, you know, the, those interactions, um, kind of wanting to connect with his teenage daughter and being completely blanked by her when he walks in and tries to, tries to bridge that, that gap. That was something I could relate to a hundred percent. And, um, you know, the, South Africa has uh, statistically has the biggest divide between the top 1% and the rest of the population in terms of income inequality. And, and even though things have changed and, you know, we have a black majority government in power and we have a, a large uh, um, emerging and, and rapidly growing black middle class, you know, there is still a great dis- discrepancy in terms of income inequality based along racial lines. So that uh, is one aspect of the film that we kind of see. We see a window into the white privilege. We see a window into white entitlement, you know, not just with Johan and his wife, but all, Diane, but also with their daughter, Nikki. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of people have commented on, on her character in this. Uh, and, and t- you know, just in terms of, you know, <laughs> what a brat, what a spoiled brat, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, but, you know, I suppose it is, we, we, we are, we are conditioned and we are, and we learn from our parents, yeah. you know, so I guess it speaks to what kind of parenting there has been in that household. Mm-hmm. Um, the other big, um, you know, so there's the, the racism element uh, in the film. There's the the inequality, income inequality element, which I'd say is very spot on. And there is a lot of, you know, racial tension in the country that hasn't even been looked at or dealt with properly. I think when 1994 rolled around and democracy happened in South Africa, you know, there was something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which did amazing work in, you know, where, where people were given the opportunity to come forward and confess to crimes that they had committed in the name of apartheid and in the name of the Nationalist Party government. And they were given amnesty and they were essentially forgiven for their sins and and we were allowed to move forward. But a lot of people didn't come forward. A lot of people didn't talk about the things that they'd done. A lot of people weren't given the opportunity to voice their pain and the trauma that they had suffered. And so as a result of the conversations that didn't take place, a lot of real emotions were swept under the rug, in my opinion, and, and are kind of now, you know, having fermented for many years, you know, there was the kind of the wonder years of Nelson Mandela. And after he left office, uh, you know, things slowly festered and and I believe it a lot has, you know, there's so many conversations that haven't taken place in this country that need to take place um, in order for people to actually empathize with each other properly, in order for people to forgive each other properly, in order for people to heal properly, and then and, and be able to move forward. And, and then if that can happen, I really believe South Africa is destined for incredible things. I think Africa is destined for incredible things in the next century, if we can get things right. And I think it it could be Africa's time. But in terms of South Africa, we certainly need to have lots of positive, but honest and hard conversations about our past before we can move forward. And I I guess, you know, with where America is, where the US is right now, we're not alone in that. I think it's a global thing. I think the world is, you know, the world is, is finding itself in an age where stuff can't be hidden anymore. It's all, it's all kind of out in the light for everyone to see. And, you know, so we, 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 we've got to actually, I guess, start being honest now with each other. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that. One of the things that always kind of comes up when I have these type of conversations is, oh, that's, this is uncomfortable. Like, and I'm like, that is exactly why we need to be having this discussion and talking about it. And like you said, and, and just, I appreciate so much for for your um, insight on that and sharing because 
I mm. think we really do get caught up. And like you said, we are sharing in this. And at the top of this, you said we're a global family. And, and if anything, yeah. we can all kind of consistently like hand in hand learn together from that. But it's mm. so fascinating that literally, you know, across the ocean, it's the exact same thing where people are so uncomfortable by the the horrors, I guess, of the past and the decisions that were mm. made. And they, they can't get past the fact that, well, that was that and we can do better. And it's OK to acknowledge it without this, mm. quote unquote, making you feel guilty and you shouldn't be feeling bad about things. I'm like, well, we should feel bad about it, but it doesn't mean that yeah. we did it right. Like it's like yeah. we did these things and like there's this disconnect. And I guess it's the same yeah. there where people are just like, well, if we talk about it, that means you're blaming us. Right. Is that yeah. the sentiment? I think that there is a lot of that, uh, where a lot of people are defensive, where a lot of people are, mm -hmm. you know, um, cause you have on one side, a lot of people who are really pissed off justifiably and making accusations. And perhaps I, I guess that, you know, the trick is like any conversation, it's like, you know, when you're speaking to a family member, you have an issue with, you know, there are certain ways in which you can open the conversation and phrase things and rather, you know, ask questions rather than make statements or you can make I statements and, you know, they're just, they're ways in which you can do it. Uh, and I think what often happens is straight away, especially on social media, where you can't actually look at someone in the eye mm -hmm. and, uh, and perhaps, you know, get a sense of irony if they perhaps have, have one in, in <laughs> or, or whatever. You, you just, we lose stuff on social media so that we go, we go straight from statement to feeling really defensive and triggered and angry. And this, so this polarization happens almost off the bat, like immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a hard way to have a, 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 a constructive conversation. So I don't know how we're going to get past that in the digital age. I guess it's one of the challenges that we face and we've still got to figure out a solution to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to add that there are certainly with, with the film, with collision, there are certainly other parallels that we see, you know, with South Africa and the rest of the world right now, mm -hmm. you know, in the U S there's a lot of xenophobia, um, you know, and there's a lot of xenophobia in South Africa, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's towards people, a lot of people who've immigrated into South Africa from other countries and who are here, you, you know, obviously there are people who've got here by any means that they can because their lives depend on it. And there are other people who've gone through the painstaking process of getting here, uh, legally at great financial and personal cost. And, and they are still being victimized because they are from a different country, because they speak a different language, because they might look slightly different or sound slightly different. And I guess the, the other similarity is that, you know, the, there are a lot of elements in the country here, a lot of people in the country here who will try and stir up and foment um, kind of xenophobic sentiment, anti-foreigner, anti-immigrant sentiment as a way of, of blaming, you know, the, the shitty socioeconomic conditions at the moment, which are, you know, we, which are being felt around the world. It doesn't really matter what kind of government is in power around the world right now. We're living in a very difficult world right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are often very quick to blame certain population groups uh, as a way of avoiding any kind of a accountability for their mismanagement yeah. as government. That, that I'm really glad you brought that up because that heartbreaking, you know, story of the young woman and her father and I get, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it her Nigerian mm. boyfriend? Was that right? So it was the, from the character's Pelesa. name is Pelesa. Yeah. And yes, Pelesa is a South African. Her father, wise man is a South African. And uh, Pelesa's boyfriend, Adze, is a Nigerian immigrant right. who has, as he states in the film, he's come in there legally. He's, 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 he's got, he's gone, done, you know, followed the, the steps that he has to follow. He's come in, he's, 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 uh, he's, a, he's a qualified chef, but he can't get any work as a chef because he, you know, no one wants to employ a Nigerian. 
And that is a very real problem that, that, that immigrants experience in South Africa. You know, there are, have been some deadly violent attacks here in the last few years on, on people who come from other countries into South Africa seeking refuge. Um, a lot of xenophobia against, you know, some people from Somalia who are, you know, hardworking shopkeepers, you know, a lot of, a lot of hardworking Somalian shopkeepers uh, have had their shops completely ransacked, looted, burned. They've been killed. So what you're seeing in the film, it's, 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 you know, it is fiction, but it is very much along the lines of, of what has gone on here. So it's, it is a window into the very real uh, and stark conditions socio-politically in South Africa right now. Yeah, and, and that, that is one of the things that jumped out at me because I go, okay, look, I know I'm watching a quote and people will say this to me too. It's just a movie. I go, hmm. well, there's a reason <laughs> that yeah. movies sometimes speak to us through these stories and that a lot of things are not quote unquote based on fact, but they're based on real conditions. Like you said, it maybe it's not that yeah. person, but I, this is clear. And, and that's that's the ignorance over here that you kind of combat where everything you see on TV is fiction until you don't want it to be, or if it fits your narrative or it, yeah. it's comfortable for you, that kind of thing. So uh, it was, it was really heartbreaking actually. And I was yeah. so anxious. That storyline for me was my favorite storyline in the yeah. film because it was so moving. Yeah. And mm. it, yeah, it was, it was really moving. And, and, and like you said, it's, it's one of those things where it's an uphill battle and we're not, unless we talk about it, unless we figure out ways to get around it and it's happening everywhere. Uh, mm. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with just how you look or just how you, you know, it's, it's literally xenophobia. Yeah. And, and uh, I think it's just education is what I constantly lean on. You, we spoke about it at the very beginning. You gave me the, the, the good lecture on, on not knowing mm -hmm. our history. Right. But I, we're, we're having the same issue here, as you know, with the anti-Asian mm -hmm. sentiment and even just being actually American and that not even resonating with people that, that Asian Americans are American. So I, it's, yeah. it's very frustrating. It's really frustrating to watch and to see, um, if it, was there a theme also around the timing of everything with Freedom Day? Was that in? Was that? Am I wrong in saying that that was part of yeah. the narrative as well? Yeah. And if you could share yeah. about that, I mean, that I think is the only yeah. key thing people will go, oh, South Africa, Nelson Mandela, and yeah. but but then that's it. You don't know much more than that. And again, because yeah. I was U.S. educated, I clearly know nothing. So. <laughs> well <laughs> Please tell no, me. It's not teach, true. Teach me more. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think you know a lot. But I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll tell you some more. So you know some more. <laughs> so uh, the 27th of April is Freedom Day in South Africa. It is a national holiday here. It is also coincidentally my brother's birthday. And it is the day on which I met my girlfriend. So it's a big day for me. It's a big day for, for you. <laughs> many South Africans. It was the day that we had our first democratic uh, election, election in 1994. That's why it is Freedom Day. And that's why it is celebrated every year. And yeah, it was, it, it was definitely you know, intentional that the, the film is that a lot of the action takes place in the film on that day, I guess, to, you know, to stir up conversation around this, around, you know, we, we, we are now, God, nearly, was it that? Nearly 30 years. Wow. We are, we're 28 years into our democracy. And I guess it's saying, you know, for certainly for, for, the, for this character, for Johan, you know, he's, He's saying you call this freedom. I think he's, he's one of the lines that I had. And, uh, and he's looking at, you know, the stark realities of South Africa now where, you know, it's uh, without a doubt, you have a, a, a party that was the party of liberation in the ANC uh, as a failed government. We had a, a, you know, a, corrupt, a corrupt element with faction within the ANC um, governing the country when Jacob Zuma was in power. It is my personal belief, and obviously this, these are my personal beliefs, um, that the Cyril Ramaphosa, our current president, is 
is a, he's straight. He's not, uh, he's not corrupt. And he is part of uh, the other faction, which is probably around about half of the ANC. So if you imagine the, the Republican Party as to where it is right now, where you have the Trumpers on one side and you have the kind of, I suppose, the anti-Trumpers, the non-Trumpers, whatever you want to call them on the other side, uh, the, the African National Congress is pretty much, you know, it's sp split down the middle in these two camps. And, uh, you know, they were the party of liberation. They were Nelson Mandela's party. They were the party, you know, uh, um, which is the, 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 the literal meaning is spear of the nation. That was the armed wing of the ANC. You know, we're preparing for bloody civil war and we're training people outside of South Africa in neighboring countries and in Russia. Uh, they were training them for the war of liberation that never happened. Uh, fortunately, we, you know, we had a peaceful, uh, almost bloodless transition into democracy. Um, but that brought with it all these other problems because you had a, literally a trained army of liberation that suddenly came back into the country. And the only skill that these people had was to fight a war that never happened. So you had a whole army of trained soldiers without an army to join. Mm -hmm. Some of them were brought into the defense force, but many of them weren't. And so straight after democracy, there was a huge spike in violent crime. And we were the car hijacking capital of the world because there were, there, was, there were stashes of AK-47s, of Kalashnikov rifles all over the country that suddenly were, were available. And I'm not kidding. You could buy one for, on the streets for 27 Rand, which is about $2. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, the U.S. isn't the only country in the world with, a, with, a, <laughs> with an assault rifle problem. We have, <laughs> yeah. we still, you know, the, the, and the, after that, there was an amnesty and people were able to hand the rifles in and no questions were asked. But you know, there was a whole lot of problems that came with it. And the ANC, you know, has failed as a government because they were a, a party of liberation. They were not, a, um, they were not, they did not have the training and the skills to run a country, in my opinion. Mm. They had some very astute politicians within the party. But, you know, basically what has happened is there, there has been a, so much corruption and nepotism and jobs for friends that there are many people in positions of, of, of government where they should be highly trained, qualified people. You've got, you've got people, you know, running entire departments that aren't qualified to do so. Mm. And uh, again, I say that these are my own personal opinions. This is, <laughs> you know, this is not, this is not necessarily the truth. This is my own opinion. And, and, and I know that there are people within the ANC who will, say that this is not true at all and uh i face them happily and, and, have a <laughs> and, face a, and have a conversation about this with them happily um but yeah i mean it's you know that this is these i suppose this is what we wanted the film to create conversations about let's let's talk about this and and you know we we can't create we can't open the door to empathy and forgiveness without having these hard conversations and we can't move forward without forgiveness. So we, these conversations have to happen. More films like this need to be made. And I'm so glad that the world is getting to see this. I mean, this was, I was, I really thought that this was going to be a conversation starter in South Africa. I didn't realize it was going to be a conversation starter around the world. And I'm so glad that it is because in the same way, you know, we wouldn't have overcome apartheid without international pressure and, and, and without the world looking at us with uh you know with, with some form of transparency transparency even though you know there was such massive media blackouts and uh uh and 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 um you know there was a massive uh amount of of god the word has just completely slipped my mind um <laughs> censorship, uh, censorship. <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> government censorship during the apartheid years but, but the world, nevertheless, put such huge pressure on South Africa, on the apartheid government, mm -hmm. to bring democracy about, that it happened. Yeah. So, you know, we probably would have had a violent civil war without that international pressure. And similarly now, I hope, 
you know, this is able to, this goes some way in letting the world see, you know, just where we're at and the struggles that we are facing as a country. And, and hopefully, you know, starting conversations around, you know, why party loyalty is such a dangerous thing. And party loyalty, I honestly believe, can bring down countries, can, it, can, it, can, it can lead to civil war. And, uh, you know, I, I think we always have to remember that politicians are there because, you know, they've been given a job to do by the voters. And if you're not happy with a job that a political party is doing, vote them out. Find a new party. Start a new political party. You know, I, 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 it's, uh, certainly where we're at here, we need a, we need a, we need a different answer. So, you know, I, we need a different party. We need a different party in power, I believe. And, uh, um, you know, I look at the American problem, you, you guys as well. It's, you, have, you have, it blows my mind that there are only two options still. <laughs> uh, you know, the fact that, that Bernie couldn't, wasn't able to run for a, a different party other than the Democratic Party, who well, I believe, again, I believe that elements within the Democratic Party have sabotaged Bernie's campaign. And, uh, and I believe Bernie Sanders would have made a phenomenal president. Uh, you know, so, but, but Bernie had to run on a Democratic ticket because there wasn't, there wasn't a third option. Uh, I think, you know, and, and America is the country of free choice. And yet there's, You've only got two options. It's like <laughs> everything else in America. You go to Costco. I always love coming to Costco when I'm in the States because it's like I just walk down the aisles and kind of go, this is amazing. Look at all these things <laughs> on all these shelves. You have so many choices. And then you get to politics. It's like the one thing that's really important and it's A <laughs> or B. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is so well summed up. I don't even think I can comment to it because I, I I agree with you. I think it's it's frustrating. Let's just say that it's very frustrating. And and there are people who are constantly trying to work against that and and for uh, having options, but also just within the ones we have, doing the best we can. And I think it's it's interesting how. All of that is coming to light. We, you know, our country is, has always been seen as this world leader and all of these things. And you're right. In so many ways, we're very advanced. And in so many ways, we are, um, you know, in the dinosaur age of, of, of thought and progression. And so, and going backwards, right? Like, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the AK problem and having, a, you know, uh, a gun issues and all of that. And I... I am, I am at a loss on a daily basis. And, you know, beyond that, I live in Florida, which is constantly on the national news for, for, for the things that are happening here. And um, it's, frust it's definitely frustrating. So I did want to talk to you as well, you know, from our last conversation about a few things and in my notes, and this may even kind of trickle in because we talk about the, you know, sociopolitical situation and colonization and how, um, we have a Caribbean tie and also your grandfather was born in China. And I wanted to get into that a lot more. Yeah, and we didn't talk about that Langley. because I only remembered that after we'd finished our last conversation. Yes, yes. I wanted to make sure that we 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 discussed that. And, and don't think you're off the hook about telling me about your martial arts journey because, you know, Sifu Mimi on the other side is coming later. But I do want to, I want to, I want to hear more uh, about yeah. that because we're, we're just going to go all over the world here in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. We've got all the heavy stuff behind us now. Yes. So now we can talk about fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh we do have this 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 incredible connection where yes. you know my I'll, I'll, it's your dad, right? Who's from the yes, Caribbean. My dad. Well, no, my dad is from China, my mom is from Jamaica. Oh, your mom's from Jamaica, that's right. Yes. So it's the other way around. So my my dad was born in St. Vincent in the Caribbean. Yeah. Caribbean uh, <laughs> and uh, you know and his whole family on that side on his mother's side are from were from the island going back many generations then my dad's dad was born 
in Hong Kong mm. because his parents were uh, were uh, his were missionaries. Oh, okay. So uh. yeah, a missionary. Uh, my grandfather was a doctor and uh, a medical officer during the Second World War uh, in the Royal Navy, and his father was. Uh, if I remember correctly, a missionary, also a doctor, but a missionary doctor. So it was a doctor at a, at a mission, but he was a very devout Christian. And, mm. uh, and my grandparents, you know, had been, were in China for, I guess, 20 years or so. And my grandfather was born while they were there. Uh, and I think they had to beat a very hasty retreat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when the colonizers were kind of yeah kicked out uh, at, at one stage I think I'm not sure if it was around the time of the rebellion or I, I'm, I'm not sure but all I know is that they had to make quite a, a fast exit right time to leave now <laughs> don't leave <laughs> don't need to back right <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. That there was that there was like, literally it's like that Indiana Jones, like the thing, the thing is closing and you just want to like slide under the door yeah. and don't worry about yeah. your hat kind of thing. Yeah. 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 It, it, it could be that way. So, Oh, that's fascinating. And did you, do you get a lot of stories from, you know, that, that time period of the, of, of them spending time there? Have you, have you, have you, got I don't, you know, I, I have yeah. very little uh, because I didn't really, you know, my grand, my father left home when, when I was nine. Mm, okay. So, you know, uh, I still have a relationship with him and I, I get little snippets of information from him whenever I see him or talk to him. But, you know, those 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 um, times are quite few and far between. Yeah. Uh, and I've never I've never managed to, you know, get any information really about ch the Chinese connection mm -hmm. other than that my grandfather was born there. Yeah, yeah, but that's so, still it's a lot. That's a lot of fun. And then talk to me about Saint Vincent. Now there, I know yeah. you've visited, and I haven't visited. That's no, the thing. I haven't visited. I no, thought you. I thought we we talked about how beautiful it is, and are you talking I've about seen, the pictures? I've seen lots of photographs. <laughs> okay, um, from my dad, and my brother has been there and spent time there. My brother, I have four brothers, so my dad has five sons, and one of my brothers has actually got uh, citizenship. He's a, a citizen of Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, and spent a lot of time mm -hmm. there. Um, my two youngest brothers have spent time there, but my eldest brother and I haven't actually ever had a chance to go. So I, um, but the book that I wrote, I've written a book, a novel around, and it's set there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, I've got a lot of information from my brother and my dad about the island. Mm -hmm. And whenever there's a, a, a cricket player uh, that comes through, who's from the island, who's, you know, promising, and is threatening to make this the 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 West Indies cricket team. My dad <laughs> always lets me know, and then and usually that very often the player doesn't get picked for the for the national team. And my dad goes, "Yeah, you know, it's politics." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I did have that on my on my list as well to ask you about your novel because it just says yeah. novel in my notes. So yeah, um, okay. and I love that it has a tie to St. Vincent. So yes. I, and I'm surprised you didn't go to write it there, you know, like well, that's the thing, you know. I it's kind of I've I've been editing the book now for way too long. It's been <laughs> over a year. Okay. That I've been in the editing stages. And there's the part of me that doesn't want to get it published until I've actually been there. Oh, because okay. I feel like I feel like there's there's got to be an, a, a second edit where I just, you know, there's so much about the, I don't know, when you're writing so much uh, about, you know, environment. I suppose, yeah, yeah. Certain things are evocative when, you know, when you're specific, it's in the specifics, it's in the details. Mm. And, uh, and I feel like I have to actually, in order to do the book justice, I have to, I have to be there and smell it for myself okay and see it for myself and live and it for eat, myself and eat and there eat. for yourself absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh I, I yeah speaking of eating i could take hoon with me because you know he's my um, other big eating fan okay okay there you go i i mean it's really an arm twist to go hey let's go spend a week in saint vincent you know that's yeah, just no, oh the horror <laughs> 
that's real tough, real tough. But you know, yeah. remembering how much you love being lamely and all like <laughs> uh you know you can get your curry goats, you can get your oh my goodness, the food there. Oh, and you know, I forgot yeah. last time I had a lamb on my thing and I wanted to show there it you. Is. Yes, my there it lamb. is. I see the lamb. <laughs> my lamb. <laughs> Um, uh, but but yeah, yeah i think i think you're i mean i i know nothing of of actual like prose or writing but there mm -hmm. must be something if your novel is set there to like you yeah. said just to wake up and look out and see the island I have to go. and I know drink, I the, have to go. drink the drinks and eat the food and like you said swim in the ocean swim yeah. in the ocean walk up you know and just hearing the dialects like even though you can talk to family and be around it but yeah. i feel submersion is is the way to go for sure i mean even if it's just an excuse to go take a week vacation in st vincent yeah. i think you should do it and and write it off yeah, as a work trip absolutely <laughs> absolutely i want to go walk in the forest and find some parrots which oh. feature in the book as well oh. you know there's a there's a you know there, there's um uh, a parrot that is endemic to st vincent okay um and uh it's found up in the rainforest there. So I want to go and find some parrots as well. And, and would that be easily seen by, by bird watchers and stuff? Or is it this like rare thing you're going to have to sit in the forest for days? Because knowing you, yeah. being the extreme sports athlete you are, you'd be like, yeah, I just, I just stayed in the rainforest for three days straight and ate berries or something. <laughs> well, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've become more attached to sleeping in a bed. <laughs> Call me soft. I don't yeah, <laughs> soft in your in your age. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I I think it's going to be exciting. Do you, can you share about the novel or not quite yet? Yeah, I can. I mean, it, it's largely autobiographical, mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose there's elements in there of my father and my dad, my my brother and and me. And then, you know, half of the novel is set there and half is, is set in the UK. And there are events in that, you know, happen to the protagonist that happened to me in my life. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not sucked out of nowhere. It has a, you know, it is a work of fiction that has a root in, in reality. Okay. And, and obviously the family connection there to St. Vincent, there's, there's an element of, you know, of truth to, well, there are many elements of truth to, to many of the goings on in the novel. Uh, and, you know, there's element of romance, there's an element of a man who finds himself in midlife crisis and kind of wondering what next. And uh, um, I've, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I, I don't ever wonder about what next from a work perspective but certainly kind of from a, a life and spiritual perspective, there, there have been times, and I, I did definitely have a midlife crisis a few years ago where I kind of went, well, what now? Mm -hmm. How do I, you know, make sense of all this? I suppose there was a period of disillusionment that I went through, which, which often helps, helps one, you know, take a more spiritual uh, path or a more inquisitive path, shall I say? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I guess that's, that's where I found, I found myself when I started writing the book. There were certainly elements of, you know, kind of uh, generational trauma, because I'm quite curious about that. I nearly lost my son in a motorcycle accident a couple of years ago. And fortunately, uh, he's, 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 he's 100% well now, and he's, yeah. he's healthy and, and, and happy. Ah, well, you know, as happy as a twenty-year-old twenty-year-old male can be. <laughs> uh, but um, you know that 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 the trauma around nearly losing him certainly got me thinking a lot about you know father-son relationships in my own life and my my relationship with my dad and mm -hmm. and 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 so there's lots of that stuff in the book. So there's there's lots of daddy issues in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like a great, well, a great outlet, but also like to, to kind of play into what you are as a creative as well. Right. You're, yeah. Um, and then hopefully artist. lots of people can relate to there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it won't just be stuff that people with 
with father issues can relate to this stuff for, for everybody, you know, there's stuff that lots of people can relate to. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, I'm going to circle all the way back now to collision. And that is just to say that that was one of the things that we set out to do in the film with regards to the character development and the feedback that I've, I've had about the character development has been so great. Uh, and, and that it, everyone said they can kind of empathize with and relate to little bits of every character. You know, even the gangster character of Brasol, the kind of racist character of Johan, it, it, there's, there's, and, you know, there, there's, there's relatable bits there for all the characters, relatable parts. And that's what we wanted. We set out to do, we set out to, you know, especially in a South African context where different people from different backgrounds and walks of life in the South African population can, can find common ground and relatable, you know, something relatable in, in someone who comes from a totally different part of the socioeconomic wheel, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've had very, you know, a lot of encouraging feedback on the street from people where, you know, a lot of people have said things like, yo man, your character's a real dick, <laughs> but I really felt sorry for him. <laughs> 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 Which, you know, and, and that's, and that's kind of what I, you know, I kind of went, okay, cool. Job done. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, really. And, and Take I think any part. parent of a teenager, you know, I yeah. have not, not mothered children directly myself, but caretaking and mentoring. I mean, anyone who's had to deal with a teenage girl might have a lot of empathy for you, even for just that sliver of a moment in, in any yeah. case, right? Um, yeah. All right, I have yeah. to ask you now how your training is going, your kung fu ah. and your martial arts okay. journey, and yeah. uh, I'm I'm excited to hear what's going on. Okay, so I I I as you you know I I kind of I I picked up uh, seven star mantis kung fu uh, mm -hmm. uh, towards the second half of last year. I started training uh, with. Uh, Sifu Wayne Pinto here in Cape Town. And um, it, my training was going really well uh, up until I had to um, start doing a lot of stunt preparation for the other Netflix project that I worked on, which was One Piece. Yeah. Uh, and so for all the, you know, the manga fans out there, that is what I've been busy with that I, I, I started, I, I had to I had to become a blonde for six months. I had to <laughs> yeah. put on 22 pounds for a role, which I found really challenging. Uh, but I had the greatest time on, on the show. And I can't wait for the, the fans of the show to see, you know, the live action version of, there are a lot of very, very die, you know, kind of fanatical diehard One Piece fans out there, which I realized as soon as the news broke that I was involved with the project. And and I think they're going to be extremely satisfied and happy with uh, with what what is what is coming their way. Um, but yeah, I basically my my kung fu training had to take a bit of a back seat when I started mm -hmm. training with the stunt team there, just because my forty nine year old body could only take so much <laughs> punishment in in, it, in one in one week. Yeah. And then uh, directly after I finished filming, my my partner and I, you know. Uh, when traveling for a couple of weeks and uh, and for you know a lot of different reasons I have not made it back into uh, into training uh, since then I've uh, told my Sifu I need to take a hiatus I just needed some you know some family time mm -hmm. and and now also I needed to shift my training uh, to, to unfortunately lose those 22 pounds and get back into Walter Buckley size so I, I had to I had to suddenly shift the, the nature of my training from lots of 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 weight you know yeah. weight training to put on the size to lots of cardio to lose it now so I've been running and cycling and swimming a hell of a lot and and that has taken up all the time uh, that I can devote to you know the physical side of mm -hmm. of my life of training so uh I'll get back in later on in the year, and uh, I do intend to to join the the warrior team. Uh, I was gonna stunt ask. Team. <laughs> yeah, in the in the stunt tent. I'm sure you've seen on social media, Brett. Yes, uh, yes, Brett I and have. The teams, the teams, uh, amazing new space. 
Wow. And uh, yeah, I haven't made it there yet, but my intention is to make it there shortly and actually yeah. join them on a weekly basis for the duration of the season because I, I really I'm I'm keen to to learn as much as I can from them. And Absolutely. Just, and I am I've I've hit my my goal weight now, so I'm back down to my original my original Buckley weight, and I'll be able to fit into my suits again, which is great. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want wardrobe angry with you. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> we keep them happy. But absolutely. Uh, luckily, you are like a, you know, triathlete, triathlon expert, and you can you can swim and, and cycle and run and do all of those things and know what to do exactly. But I know that regardless, yeah. it's so difficult. I, you know, trying to lose yeah. five pounds is really difficult yeah. <laughs> for me. So yeah. I can't even imagine um, yeah. the discipline. But I, I want to ask if you're, because I know you didn't get to do years of Kung Fu training with your Sifu or anything, but I know no. that the little that we spoke, you yes. really connected with it. And I'm curious mm. what you did learn. How does that yep. um, translate into the other training that you do? And then of yep. course, with the stunt team, that's totally different because you know yep. there's a lot of wushu, there's a lot of different styles that you're going to learn, but when you go to do anything physical, have you found there to be a crossover or what do you take from your Kung Fu training? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, in all the other work I've always done in the past, you know, with fight choreography, the my biggest challenge has always been uh, to be more fluid. And I found, you know, the stunt teams that I've worked with in the past have always had to work really hard for me not to be kind of, like this, <laughs> I get I, I get quite tense, and I get I, I get uh, I, I've, I my biggest challenge is always to stay loose, stay fluid, and stay relaxed. And I found with one piece that had changed completely thanks to my kung fu training. Okay, good. Um, it's just relaxed me a lot more. Um, I'm able to 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 make it more of a dance now. Um, you know, I was. I, I was able to do a little bit of Tai Chi as well with my Sifu, which helped oh, a lot. Um, and, uh, and, and I found just, just moving um, as a fighter, you know, kind of getting, having that stuff uh, ingrained on a weekly or twice weekly basis. I, I was able to not have to think about the basic fight stuff, just in terms of my footwork, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the past, I would always get, tied up with my footwork and it was kind of slow and laborious uh everything's just more fluid now and 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 it came a hell of a lot more easily so it's 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 helped it's been like light years of change i love it i love uh, it i love to hear that <laughs> yeah and and I know that you are looking forward to and I, I know you can't talk too much about warrior but uh you know obviously but uh, ah. Brett's just teasing us with those videos and, and also like, yeah. oh my gosh, I feel sore just watching, but I, I don't know. I'm going to have to find a way to just crash the set and come and visit and, and just sneak in there. Can you like sneak me totally. in one day? I mean, that tent, yeah. I just want to see it. <laughs> I just want to yeah. stretch with everyone. <laughs> I'm going to say right now, we're going to get you in. You're going to have to do some COVID. There will be some COVID testing required oh, and COVID <laughs> protocol stuff, but we'll get you there. Oh my sure. gosh. Maybe, maybe, I, I'm so jealous. Maybe you can lead lead the uh, lead a class. Yeah, I'd love to lead a class. I'm gonna I'm just gonna text Brett every day like Kung Fu, uh, Northern Traditional Kung Fu class. Let me know what day and that way I can schedule oh, it in or so sword cool. class or, you know, let me know. I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. But, oh, it looks amazing. And the team, I mean, you know, you look at those stunt uh, team experts and, you know, I, I feel my 40 plus year old self going, oh gosh, you know, this is, yeah. this is, there's a time for that in your life, but like kudos and just it's so much excitement yeah. surrounding it. And I, I think yeah. I can guess who you're most excited to see, but I'm sure it's this this reunion is is something you're really looking forward to who are you most excited to see <laughs> um you know what i'm actually looking forward to seeing everybody yeah uh yeah i'm looking forward to seeing who <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, i'm looking forward to seeing absolutely everybody i mean yeah. we you know i feel like it, it does feel like it's going to be a big family reunion mm -hmm. and uh, some of the team are already here as you know and 
uh, guys, yeah, I think Dean arrives this weekend. You know, you've got Hoon coming in at the end of next week. Um, I think everyone's coming in like in, in, the, in the next two weeks. So, wow. and then we start shooting July 18th, the cameras start to roll. So yeah. uh, regardless of whether I'm in that first scene or not, I'm, I'm going to be on set when, when cameras roll again, <laughs> because I think there, there are going to be a few, a few tearful, tearful eyes oh, uh, definitely. Uh, on set when we, when we roll again. Yeah, gonna, what a journey. Yeah be a very emotional emotional moment absolutely so oh yeah. my gosh what a reunion what a journey and and so exciting that it's 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 really it's like you knew it was happening but now it's like it's really happening people are here it's the stunt tent really is up happening. i mean it's it's really happening yeah. everyone's coming in and you know watching everyone's post and you know mm. texting with perry everybody's just the excitement is is phenomenal yeah. and that's why i'm so so jealous but super excited oh. for everything and and i'll definitely oh, the, and the fans the fans are <laughs> it's we have got such an exciting season ahead there is just so much the character development is insane there's there's uh so the writers have have let us all in to you know a lot of our kind of character journeys and yeah. and we've we've had snippets of other characters journeys as well uh they're not they're not letting too many cats out the bag but they certainly have been quite generous in letting us know where our own characters are going in the season mm -hmm. and i've spoken to some of the other actors and it's 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 gonna be an insane season in terms of where all the characters go oh my so, and we've got some amazing new characters i don't even know if i'm allowed to say that <laughs> Well, there's always new characters on new a char show. Yeah, there's and, always and new some, characters on a show. But, but yes, <laughs> and some very exciting characters coming. Uh, oh my gosh! Uh, <laughs> some very exciting actors. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm ah. I'm super psyched about it. I can't wait. And amongst each other, are you allowed to tell each other like, oh, here's what what's happening with my character? Or do they want everyone to kind of keep keep things hush hush? I don't know if I should answer that. I okay. <laughs> You're like, because I've already, myself. I've already, I've already uh, <laughs> broken that rule. If that's the case, no, I'm just kidding. Oh God, no, it's well, just. Well, I mean, you kind of uh, have to know when you're sharing yeah. a scene, right? Like what's oh, going absolutely. on in a sense. So yeah. you, you so have that is, there's, that is, there's that. That yeah. is where there is a where there is crossover. Okay. And right. uh, I mean, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I know some amazing. There's some amazing scenes that I'm getting to shoot with, with some, yeah, some characters that I just, I really love working with so it's it's and some yeah i yeah i'm so excited oh my gosh i'm so excited <laughs> too. you're wait. getting me excited i'm like i'm like googling um flights right now <laughs> how long how long is filming gonna go for we we need to be done and i think we are the aim is to be done just before christmas oh wow okay so yeah uh, so we basically we start you know the 18th of july and we shoot all, all the way through, through the rest of the year. Okay. Wow. Okay. So I've got time for my visit. I can, I can plan yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah. You and I, you time. know, Jason, I had him on the show and I'm like, well, we're supposed to be planning a, a karaoke outing because he said yeah. they never had that. And, and he's like the expert leader, ringleader of all karaoke. And I'm like, what? And, <laughs> and you haven't, you haven't done this. I'm like, you don't even need a bar. You can do it in the stunt tent. Just set up your, your, totally. your yeah. Yeah. Then everybody can join in. So, oh my gosh, so much fun. Um, looking forward to all of the amazing things, obviously, uh, warrior season three, everyone is super psyched but like you said your your film collision right now is currently on netflix netflix and then also uh your manga release of one piece i mean you've got a lot going on sir <laughs> yeah i mean it's 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 been a really you know fortunately busy time uh and there's the complete kind of antithesis of where I was two years ago when we were in in hard lockdown and there was yeah. like 10 months I went for a 10 month stretch without a day's work and and a lot of the acting community was in the same boat and a lot of people were really scared and you know kind of not knowing how our industry was going to survive and if if it was going to survive and if we were ever going to work again and where the world was going, it was just a, you know, really scary place. And we, we th seem to be coming out. Well, we have, we are coming out the other side of that and we're still standing. 
We're a little Absolutely. battered and bruised. Uh, <laughs> Nothing we can't but recover we, from, though. We're, we're, we're yeah, getting there. <laughs> absolutely. We're getting back up, you know, and uh, and that's what it's all about. It's, we've taken a couple of hits and we, we're getting back in the fight. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Well, Langley, thank you so much for the conversation. I'm looking forward to uh, episode number three with you. <laughs> Cannot wait, Mimi. Thanks so much. <laughs> all right. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.